get underway. So how are we? Getting into the rhythm? Acclimatized to the altitude yet? All right. So I'm here yet again to talk about something I don't actually do as a day job. Um, going to move on from the solar wind and start talking about the Earth and planets, namely the ionospheres and magnetospheres. And uh, even though I don't study these, I do stand by the idea that as a heliophysicist, I should at least understand why it is that the Earth and the planets have ionospheres, and some of them have magnetospheres. Right? So, so I, think, I think we all just need to at least know enough to be able to answer this question and say a little bit more about why these things are the way they are. And um, the simple answer to why the Earth and planets have ionospheres is because of the corona in particular because of the EUV and X-ray photons that the corona, as we know, we talked about the fact that that gets up into the millions of kelvins. It's emitting radiation in these wavelengths. And the interaction with an atmosphere will create an ionosphere. And of course, we've already dealt with this. Why does it have a corona? Right? As an ionosphere because of the corona, why does it have a corona? And that's because of the magne magnetic field and the heating. And then we went through the process by which that heating creates a plasma of higher than expected density. Uh, and that's what radiates the x-rays in the EUV. Uh, and then what we haven't really talked about because of the structure of the summer school is the answer to why it has a magnetic field. And that's because of the internal dynamo. So anyway, uh, we'll, we've already answered this. So now we can move on to why there is this ionosphere. And before I can answer that, I need to review uh, basically the, the parts of the, the Earth's atmosphere. <clears throat> so this is just the Earth. And uh, we basically have an atmosphere that is typically divided into four layers. The troposphere, where we live, the stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere. What distinguishes these, really, is the fact that in the troposphere, the temperature falls off with height. How many people have plans on Saturday or Sunday to hike into the mountains? Anyone? Right. OK, you hike enough, you will notice it gets colder as you go up. You will not be able to go up to nine, nine kilometers. That's where Everest is. But if you've ever seen pictures of people climbing on Everest, it's cold up there. Right? The temperature definitely falls off in the troposphere. In the stratosphere, it does the opposite. It increases with height. The mesosphere, it falls again. In the thermosphere, it increases. And between all four of these spheres, we have the pauses, tropopause. Right? This is the the layer, the uh, interfaces between them. Um, historically, uh, we have thought of heliophysics as really including the mesosphere and the thermosphere. Okay. Now, this is you're young. This is the 21st century. So I don't want to, I don't want to dwell on on these historical divisions. Although there's another interesting uh, division here at 50 kilometers. Has anyone read? Tom Wolf's book, The, the Right Stuff. OK. Seen the, anyone seen the movie? OK. Anyone seen First Man? Right? Neil Armstrong. So the first scene, where is he on the first scene? Does anyone remember? Because this is also in The Right Stuff. What is he doing? Is he in a space capsule? Anyone remember? First scene. It's exciting. Get you in. Ripping. He's in a plane called the X-15. This is part of the right stuff. They were flying planes. And anyone who was piloted a plane over 50 kilometers was deemed to have gone into space. Neil Armstrong was an astronaut before he joined the astronaut corps, right? Because he flew an X-15 into, into space. So that's just, just to say that we're, we're, we're generally interested in what we're going to talk about here are these two layers. But the funny thing is, I haven't said anything about the ionosphere, right? There's four layers here. None of them is the ionosphere. So how does this answer my question? The ionosphere is essentially the ionized components of these atmospheres here that are ionized by the x-ray EUV photons. And I just want to draw your attention also, because we've seen, uh, <clears throat> 
I plotted it the other way. This is distance, this is temperature. But there's a peak in temperature right here at the stratopause, right? Increases in the stratosphere, decreases in the mesosphere. So there's, there's this peak in temperature. We saw these in the plots of the, the heliosphere as well. When we saw a peak in temperature, what did we know was happening? What did that tell, tell us? Temperature at the local maximum. Heating, yeah. There's heating going on here. Something is heating the atmosphere at 50 kilometers, roughly, in this model picture. Any thoughts what that could be? What? OK, because ozone is hot. It is the ozone layer. That's actually a symptom of the heating, not absorption. Yes. This is where the radiation is being absorbed. Right? And, and UV is, uh, ozone is helping to create that absorption. So really, what we're interested in here is the interaction of these photons with the atmosphere. So here's a wonderful plot, one of my favorites from volume three, anyway. Uh, and this is. Like all wonderful plots, it's a little complicated at first. This is our height scale again. There's our old friend, the various layers of the atmosphere. And on the horizontal axis is wavelength of light from x-rays and EUV out to about here. And then far ultraviolet and near ultraviolet over here. And then visible starting about there. And what the color represents is the amount of energy being deposited. We have a, I guess I threw out the color bar, uh, but it's, it's the amount of ener the energy density of absorption of radiation. So this is where the, the radiation is being absorbed. And you can see this big yellow peak. This is the highest amount of absorption. And it is peaking right, it is sort of around that layer. This is what's creating that ozone. This is absorption by ozone of this near ultraviolet radiation is creating this peak in the stratopause uh, right there. Um, and so as you get to long, shorter and shorter wavelengths, the photons are being absorbed even higher up in the atmosphere. The, uh, the photons don't make it even down that far. Visible light is not absorbed at all. That's why air is so clear. Light just goes right through it. So we see this, this structure of where the photons are being absorbed. And these x-ray photons are absorbed very high up. So if I want to make my image of the solar corona, aside from waiting for eclipses to see the solar corona, I have to observe it in EUV photons, say 171 angstroms. I need to go up above the portion of the atmosphere that's absorbing this radiation, right? Looking at it from the ground is no good. It's all cut off by 100 kilometers up. So I need to go way up to observe that. OK, so the, the real, the real t story here is we need to understand where these photons are creating an ionosphere. Now, do you suppose they, they could be these photons here? This is uh, for those of you who work in angstroms, 2,000 angstroms, 3,000 angstroms. That's a sort of. Uh, three or four electron volt photons. Is that going to help ionize all my molecules? Any thoughts? If I had hydrogen, how much, how how much of a photon do I need to ionize a hydrogen atom? That's just because that's the one we all know. Fourteen eV, right? Right. So I would need to be down here, actually. Tw uh, right about here, and then oxygen and nitrogen molecules, very similar. So these photons here are not powerful enough to ionize things. So this isn't creating an ionosphere. This is creating a bit of a, a heating in the atmosphere. This is where my ionosphere is going to be. It's coming from the absorption of, sorry, when I, this, this, these layers up here. This is where the EUV photons are ionizing things. So to really understand that, we need to think about the fate of a photon. We need to think about how it is a photon is making it into the atmosphere. And the only thing I'm going to think about in terms of the very complicated interactions of photons with molecules is the cross-section for absorption. 
sigma. I'm just going to imagine I know what that sigma is, that cross-section, right, centimeter squared. That's the cross-section for one molecule, an average molecule, to absorb a photon of a given wavelength. So the so-called optical path, that is, if I go a certain distance along the axis x, I'll just write it as x here, or l, um, I have to, I encounter a certain number of things that can absorb me, and that is tau, right? The integral of sigma, number density of molecules, uh, number per cubic centimeter times cross-sectional area in centimeters cubed, integrated d centimeter. This gives me a dimensionless number, which is the average number of absorptions I will suffer. So how is it <laughs> I don't just die after, that's like the average number of deaths. <laughs> How is it I don't just die after, get absorbed after one absorption? Or why, why, do, why is this integral ever bigger than one? Maybe I should answer that. Because it's an average, okay? So if the average number of absorptions is, is one, then actually my probability of being absorbed once is e to the minus 1. And my probability of being absorbed, this is my probability of, of survival, actually. This is the probability of not being absorbed at all. It's also e to the minus 1. What? I'm so sorry, I can't hear you. Why is there an exponential? So when you're dealing with things that have to happen, integer numbers of times, like absorptions, then you have what's known as a Poisson distribution. Anyone know about Poisson distributions? Right, so counting statistics. And that has an exponential in it. Also has factorials, but fortunately, the only factorial we see here is zero factorial, which is one. So the, this is the probability of being absorbed zero times, even though I have an average number of absorptions that might be bigger than one. If it's very much bigger than one, I'm e to the minus a big power. Sorry to dwell on this, but this is, this is sort of basic reasoning about luck, shall we say. Uh, and, and it happens all the time in space physics, in astrophysics, okay? So this is known as the optical path. It is the integral over the, the density of stuff times the cross-section of being absorbed. And I put it inside an exponential because that's how I get a probability out of it, because it's the probability, really the probability of being absorbed zero times which is like the probability of dying zero times. <laughs> what happens if you die zero times? You survive, right? This is a survival probability, okay? P of x. So this is the probability my photon will make it down. Now, the, the last thing we need to think about is these photons aren't necessarily going straight down. They're coming in at an inclination because the sun isn't always directly overhead. So it comes down with an angle chi, and so dl is actually minus dz, z goes up. We're talking about altitude here, secant of chi. That's just the geometry part. And final bit of this is the number density of absorbers, of molecules, goes exponentially with height as well. This is a hydrostatic atmosphere. Is everyone familiar with that? This is why not only will it get colder when you go up, the air will become even thinner. You're already. You're already 15% of a scale height above sea level. So the amount of air is 1 minus e to the, you get the, you get the idea, it's 85%. Uh, and as you keep going up, the density of molecules falls off even faster. Falls off, sorry, exponentially as you go up. OK? So these two ingredients are going to allow me then to do this integral. And this is my favorite part. The tau, the path length, involves this integral of an exponential, OK? And there's, the, there's just reworked. You know, the integral of an exponential is an exponential. Sorry, this is my favorite part. Because then what you do is you put this tau into the exponential, and you get an exponential of an exponential. That is cool in my books. I, rarely do you come across this kind of expression, an exponential of an exponential. And this falls off very fast. Okay, e to the minus e to the minus some power of z. 
Okay, and just to give you an idea. And so uh, I brushed by the math. I just want to remind you some of these factors, including the cross section for absorption, have all been worked into that's the scale head of the atmosphere, this Z tau 1. All right? It just involves the logarithm of the scale height and the cross section. Okay? But th that just tells me sort of where this exponential is going to become very small or very large, depending which way you're going. So here's, here's an idea. If my cross section is that, 10 to the minus 17 centimeters squared, that's very small. But remember, molecules are small, right? This is kind of the size you would expect. Actually, this is closer to the size of a molecule. This is, so if I have a big cross section, then my exponential of an exponential falls from a probability, a survival probability of one up here at 200 kilometers, 3, 250 kilometers. It drops precipitously to zero probability of survival. <laughs> by the time I get down to 130 kilometers for that cross section. Smaller cross section means I can go deeper before I'm running into enough stuff that I am going to be killed. Right? The probability of survival there is zero. So this tau, which just involves, have I rewritten it up here? I didn't rewrite it, but uh, this, this is, yeah. This is just some other math. This will all be posted. It's really not important. The real key idea is the smaller the cross-section for absorption, the further you're going to make it down. But you're not going to make it down forever. And you're going to be stopped at some different depth, depending on how far you go. So far, so good. Now, so here is, these are the different wavelengths we've got. And the different wavelengths we've got. This is basically what that cross-section does. And it has a lot of structure. This is that z tau. It involves the logarithm of this. But this has a lot of structure because it is a complicated problem to think about how a molecule is going to absorb a photon. There's lots of things that can happen. What is being pointed out here, this is absorption by, by ozone. So this is why it was pointed out that that layer there, which is absorbing between 2,000 and sort of uh, 3,000 angstroms is mostly being absorbed by ozone. Ozone is not a well-made molecule. Right? This, is, this is the lemon of molecules. And so a very long wavelength photon, like 2,000 angstroms, 2,500 angstroms, has enough energy to knock it apart. And that's a good way to absorb energy, to get knocked apart. That's how, that's how uh, Formula One race cars survive impact. They fall apart. Right? They absorb all the energy by falling apart. And that's what these, these valiant ozone molecules are doing. Here's O2 being destroyed. And then here's the ionizations. And you really need, like we were saying, sort of 1,200, 1,300, uh, 1,200, uh, 800 angstroms before you can ionize things. So these are the ranges where your absorption is due to the ionization. Okay. And then this is z tau. This is basically where that absorption will happen. You'll see it looks exactly like this. That's because this is a log scale and this is a linear scale. So when I take the log, it just looks the same as that. There are our different layers. And so here is the layers where we're going to do the absorption that will do ionization. So far, so good. This is going a little slow. I apologize. It'll get faster. There are the three nominal cross sections I talked about. There's a very strong cross section right around uh, 5,000 angstroms. Drops off to sort of this smaller cross section. And this very small cross section is what we get from ozone. So those are the kinds of, of profiles, survival profiles I get for photons of these different wavelengths. But to turn that into heating, well, first of all, I need to know if I have a probability of surviving, then the amount of energy coming down is the probability of surviving times the incident intensity. That is, energy per second per or power per square centimeter 
initially at the top of the atmosphere times the probability it's going to make it down to that depth. And here's the heating. How much is that intensity falling off with height? I need to take a derivative of my favorite exponential of an exponential function, and I get this function here. This function here is, is, gives rise to what's known as the Chapman layer, which is just a named after a very great geophysicist named Chapman. Uh, and this simple picture gives you a very good handle on why the absorption looks the way it does. One thing about taking the derivative of this awesome function is it gives you this nose-like peak. And this is in a semi-log plot, right? But still, it falls off very rapidly on the underside and not quite as rapidly on the top side. OK, but this is the power that is being delivered to the atmosphere by ionization, depending on the cross-section for ionization. And as we've seen, that cross-section is wavelength dependent. So it gives rise to exactly these kinds of profiles. You can, if, you, if you're good at, at interpreting color bars, you can see the blue, red, and yellow are piled up very tightly on the bottom here and much less tightly on the top. That's because of this structure here. Right? It's very, very steep there. And that's really what's going on. We're having the photons are getting in, and they're not making it past that height there. But most of their energy is being deposited low down just because that's where the probability of survival is falling off most rapidly. All right, so that tells us about every photon. As I said, we're really only interested in the photons that are going to do the ionization. So here's a sort of simple chemistry diagram which tells us if I, ionize, if I ionize O2, I can turn it into O2 plus. If I ionize O, I turn it into O plus. Then there's other ways of getting NO plus, N2 plus, moving around in this little thing here. The most important thing is these first transitions where I turn neutral molecules into ions, and then also electrons are flowing around that I've knocked off. That's in this range here. So there is my bottom of sort of what we will think of as being the ionosphere. Here is a, just a plot, and we'll get to why it looks the way it does. This is the number of electrons that have been knocked loose, easiest way to count these things, per cubic meter in this case, as a function of height. And you'll see, we'll go into this a little bit more, there's, there's four curves here. Two are for daytime, and two are for nighttime. We'll discuss more how it is if the ionosphere is created by X-ray EUV radiation from the sun, how you have an ionosphere at night. Okay, you can see it's quite a bit lower. Um, and then we have different curves for solar min and solar max. We've already discussed the fact that there's more X-ray flux during solar max. So it's going to create a, more of an ionosphere. Okay, and so. It really is these portions of the photons, and I pointed out that is the photons that are coming from the corona and the transition region. So that's the part of, of the sun that's uh, creating the ionosphere. Lastly, we have to talk about the fact that I've told you how you create ions and electrons. But if you just kept ionizing the atmosphere continuously, we wouldn't have an atmosphere left to breathe. Of course, you also get destruction of electrons or destruction of ions by the recombination. Question? Uh, no, that's just a person yawning. No questions. OK. Uh, so here is, here's the idea of how we're going to, I've told you about the energy deposition rate, this nice curve here. Essentially, to get the production rate, Q, I'm going to look at that cross section, the density, and some function which is, involves that probability, OK? That is the, that is the um, production rate. And the destruction, actually, this, uh, sorry, I wanted to point out, this is proportional to the number density of, ion, of, of molecules, neutral molecules I'm going to, I'm going to ionize, OK? Linearly proportional. For destruction, I need a product of the number density of electrons and the number density of ions. And I have charge neutrality, so pretty much I have a one-to-one -one balance. So it's really the number density of electrons squared 
time's a constant that I need to, again, do a lot of physics to figure out the quantum mechanical process by which an electron can bind on to a charged molecule and form a neutral molecule. Um, but the important thing is this, this destruction rate goes as density squared. So I have density squared for destruction, density for creation. If I set them equal, I'm going to be able to work out what the number density is. And it's basically the square root of the production rate over this rate of destruction. Okay? This gives me the equilibrium number density I'm going to get for a given Q is also proportional to F infinity, the rate at which the photons are coming in. Okay? So this is just a balance of production and destruction. And so if I take a square root of this, this function here, I will get the number density. Now I'm going to hit you with sort of real reality. This is a model as well. But this is a, a, a fairly detailed mo model. Again, there's a color bar along this axis. Now we have time in hours, local hours, from 0 o'clock, otherwise known as midnight. There's noon. There's the following midnight, 24 o'clock. And then it just continues on just for balance. Um, this is on March 21st, Okay, the easiest thing to do. Let's go for the equinox. So sun rises at local 6 o'clock, sets at local 18 o'clock, okay? and noon is noon, is at 12 o'clock. Uh, it's also 45 degrees latitude, so that gives me the, the angle. And what you can see, I've made some slices in this data. Here is a slice at noon. Here I've plotted what looks like very much like that curve over there. You'll see I don't plot anything below 180 kilometers. And then as at various times, I've plotted, I've plotted something very low down, something right around the peak, and something high up. And this shows the number density at those heights as a function of time. So you can see for the highest one, it's very steady. For the lowest one, it's low and then peaks and then low again. And then for that intermediate one, it varies an intermediate amount. My question for you, thinking about everything we've just talked about, no prior knowledge of the ionosphere unexpected. <laughs> I didn't have any. Why does this lower area vary so much more than this higher area? Let's just think about the intermediate and the high. Let's not worry about the low yet. Think about that. Different what? Different chemistry. OK, I have been reluctant to include chemistry, because basically I don't understand chemistry. You're, you have part of the answer. But I would claim it's all captured in alpha. That's where the chemistry has come in. Alpha and then this sigma ionization. Um, but I think there's something, there's something even more fundamental. Even a, a simple-minded astronomer like myself, who just thinks alpha and sigma might be the constants could understand why it is that up high, we have so little variation. And down low, we have much more variation. And remember, the sun is only shining at this time here. The sun is only shining at this time here. And then it seems not to drop off all that much. So, sorry, what? Which, which place? OK, why? Uh, OK, why is it more collisional? Is that chemistry? It's much more dense, right? The, the recombination rate when is n squared, right? This alpha may or may not change. But what's really important is it goes as n squared. The number of collisions, and this is true in cities too, is going as the density of the cars squared. <laughs> So if you double the number of cars, you're quadrupling the number of accidents. Okay? And so when you go lower down, n squared is higher. In fact, let me, let me say, I assumed equilibrium. 
In fact, in the nighttime, it's not in equilibrium because F is zero. There's no source term. But the sink term is this loss term, which is proportional to NE squared. So the number time rate of change of NE is proportional to minus NE squared. If NE is large, this is a very big rate and you drop off fast. If it's small, it's a smaller rate and you drop off more gradually. Okay. So, so even that simplified picture really does give you this amount of knowledge. Now, you would think there'd be a depth at which it should go to zero. You have to invoke other things like the diffusion of these species from higher up. Okay. Um, I want to I wanna now cut back to what I said I didn't want to think about, which is chemistry. There's my, my chemistry diagram. Uh, here is, as a function of altitude again, this is the density now plotted correctly in centimeters to the minus 3, not meters to the minus 3. Um, this is the density of electrons, really. Or sorry, no, these are the densities of each one of these, these constituents. Electrons are just in the black. Um, so here is oxygen, single, uh, uh, so, sorry, atomic oxygen. Here's molecular oxygen. Here's molecular nitrogen. Here's helium, which is its own molecule. Uh, here is the ionized versions of each one of those. So you can see, even at the peak, <laughs> this balance between ionization and recombination, even at the peak, is giving us basically something that is 99.9% .9 neutral. Okay? So the ions are a very, very small component of this. Uh, they really, and you know, for other species, the, the fraction is even smaller. But um, that is really what gives us the electrically reactive portion of the atmosphere. That's what we call the ionosphere. So it is actually sitting right in the thermosphere. Um, my next question, though, to you, get you thinking in the morning, we see all these different things. And I said that these things fell off exponentially with height. And this is a log linear plot. And these are sort of straightish lines. But they're different straight lines for different things. Sorry, what? What? I can't. Different scale heights, exactly right. And what? And which? So how does the scale height depend on the mass of the object? Is it inversely right? It has the mass in the denominator. So when I go to from O to O2, I know how to do that. This is twice as heavy as that, so the scale height is half as big. The slope here in the semi-log plot is going to be twice as big. Oops, and I think I didn't do that one. I did this one, and yeah, you, so you get the idea. Here's the scale height for oxygen, 38 kilometers. Here's the scale height for nitrogen, 43 kilometers. So it falls off le less steeply, and so that's, that's one of the consequences of this. And the uh, helium falls off very slowly, 300 kilometers. So you really get quite a bit of helium up here, uh, very little in, the, in the, the lower atmosphere here, which is why it was uh, so hard to discover. So here is our basic picture of the ionosphere. It basically is this set of ions and electrons that are constantly being created and destroyed through this process. But it gives us a conducting fluid, a plasma. This is what we were hearing about yesterday. The neutrals you can think of as a separate fluid. Right? There's this neutral part that doesn't care about electric fields and magnetic fields. However, the fact that every ion used to be a neutral, and it's bound to be a neutral very soon, means that those two fluids are very tightly coupled. Okay? It isn't that they collide with each other and, and couple each other that way. It's just that they constantly turn into each other with all of the motions that they used to have. So this gives us a very strong drag force between these two.
okay? Uh, one of the things that, the, the reason this became very evident uh, early on, very early on, is if we have a plasma of electron density Ne, it will screen out all electric fields that oscillate slower than the plasma frequency. The plasma frequency is this. It's sort of 100 kilohertz to the, uh, uh, sorry, 10 kilohertz times Ne to the 1 half. So I will, I will back up, sort of just write down this formula. And I'm going to back up and show you the plot I was showing you before to try to figure out from this basic atmosphere here, what sort of radio frequencies would we be able to observe from outer space would we be able to observe on the ground? What sort of radio frequencies could we observe on the ground? Given that any frequency below the plasma frequency is going to see the ionosphere as if it was just a sheet of metal. Right? It's a conductor. It ain't getting through. Well, also, sorry, what? OK. She, she did even one, one more. Uh, she said 20 megahertz. If, if we use this formula here, Ne at its peak, the, the shiniest part of the magnetosphere, of the ionosphere, is going to come from a density of 10 to the 6. So a square root of 10 to the 6 is 10 to the 3. So that turns this into 10 to the 7. I would have gotten 10 megahertz, but you're using real knowledge now. I also know now, as I lecture to students, at an increasing distance from my experience, not everyone really appreciates the frequencies of radio waves that we used to use to communicate with one another. But 10 megahertz is, is sort of below the AM band, above the AM band and below the FM band. So yeah, uh, you, you cannot get radio signals from outer space typically below that frequency. Um, the next thing I'll point out, all of this had to do with F infinity, Q over alpha, F infinity. This is the equilibrium density. It's going to go as a square root of F infinity, which you remember is the flux of photons of these wavelengths that we're talking about, the EUV and X-ray photons. Here is a, a plot I showed you before. This is the flux in X-ray photons as a function of year, starting from this is a solar minimum, solar max, and then back down to another solar minimum. So F infinity is sort of 50 times bigger here than here. So Ne will be seven times larger here at solar max than it is at solar min. So there to there, sort of, sort of seven. Seven is close to 10, right? That's, that sort of explains the gap in these between solar min and solar max. Okay, and there's other processes at work. So this is a very simplified picture. That's why the real plots look a little more complicated than that. Um, also, in some of these volumes, this sort of shows that was a typical variation. But you could imagine during a solar flare, you're going to get even higher fluxes of x-rays. And the ionosphere is going to change accordingly. And this is a plot that uh, I think um, Jan Soika produced. Unfortunately, it, it sort of progresses. This S is, is a way of measuring the amount of flux. And it's a logarithmic scale. So negative just means 10 times, I think, less flux than that. And this is 100 times more flux and 1,000 times more flux. And it shows you that all of these ion species, but let's just focus on the electrons, the structure changes quite a bit as the, as the amount of, of x-ray flux goes up. OK. Got a few more minutes before we can break. Um, I want to just say that was the Earth, it's a, a planet that's near and dear to my heart because I was born here. I grew up here, continue to live here. I own property on Earth. But there are other planets, Venus and Mars. They have atmospheres. They are subject to 
X-ray and EUV photons as well. Now, the chemistry of these is different. Again, I promise I wasn't going to think too much about chemistry, but it is true. We have a mostly nitrogen atmosphere. Both Venus and Mars have mostly CO2 atmospheres. Uh, that, that's sort of the big difference that we want to think about. And so some of these rate coefficients are going to change. Uh, here is from uh, Stan Solomon, uh, volume three again. The uh, sort of picture of how those constituents sort out in the Venetian atmosphere. And this is for a particular incident angle of light, 60 degrees from the vertical. Um, and you can see that we get O2 plus, CO2 plus, et cetera. I don't want to dwell on all these differences. I just want to show you that a lot of the things we've talked about are universal really apply to these other planets. And Mars, the same thing. So here's that chemistry diagram. We can ionize CO2 and get CO2 plus, et cetera. And then here are the constituents. Uh, interestingly enough, where these things peak isn't that dramatically different between these planets. Sort of 160 kilometers, 140 kilometers. Earth, it's closer to almost 200 kilometers. but. Uh, CO2 is maybe a little harder to ionize. Anyway, um, so this, this at least gives us an idea of an answer to the question why it is these planets have ionospheres. And then once we've answered that and have a basic picture of how photons go into an atmosphere, get absorbed, ionize things, and then how those things recombine to become neutral again, we get a picture of why the ionosphere looks the way it does why it varies the way it does. So I'm going to let us break there for five minutes, and we'll pick up after that. And if, well, if there are any real questions, any questions for everyone, I'd be happy to answer them now. Otherwise, you can come up. I can answer a few questions. Remember, I don't do this for a living, so this is a hobby. All right, let's take a break then. the electron density. Okay. Ah, E minus. Okay. So, so if, if, well, this is all right. logarithmic. Somehow, yeah, somehow exactly. you exactly. can exactly. add up all those pluses. Yeah. Exactly. It's a total density of all the pluses. The electron, yeah. uh, O plus, O2 plus, and NO plus. Because by charge balance, they have to balance the electron. But it's also the number density. It's less than the neutral so it's always just that it's always greater than all the ions. 
Yeah. All right. I think we've got I've got a better handle on when I'm going to finish this time, unlike last time. Um, so we could get people back here. While we're waiting for a few more people to filter back, any other interesting, any other questions about this? Any other questions about people bison collisions? Those are also, that's something I know much more about because I live in such a high bison density population. So. Nick, could you make sure that people know that we're starting? We need uh, they can. So as a build up, a sort of transition into the magnetospheric part, I want to start thinking about how the solar wind is interacting with our planet. Okay? The solar wind is what we were talking about until now, and it is this wind of, of hot material, as we've said. Um, it also has magnetic field entrained in it. And really, that's a crucial piece of it. It's a conducting plasma with magnetic field. And it is going to see an ionosphere as a conducting ball, okay? as a metal conducting ball. And that's really what leads to its interaction. Right? It's going to see this conducting metal ball, and it's not going to be able to go through it, so it needs to go around it. And the interesting thing, for those of you who have studied some amount of, of hydrodynamics, you know that when you're in a subsonic regime, and you have air coming at your car, the air actually, and you can definitely trace this if you're driving through a nice blizzard, and you see all those snowflakes coming up over your car, they start moving up around your car out in your headlights. They know you're coming. Right? And the reason a snowflake knows you're coming is the air knows you're coming. And the reason the air knows you're coming is because hopefully you're driving slower than the speed of sound, and sound waves are going out ahead of you to warn the air that you're coming. And start, start moving up. This obstacle's coming. The solar wind does not obey any speed limits, and therefore it is going supersonically. There's no way for it to know a planet is coming. Or, yeah, as far as the solar wind is concerned, the planet is moving at it. Okay, and it has no forewarning. And that's when you get a shock. A shock is a hydrodynamic surprise. You have no idea that it's coming. But what's happened 
is it doesn't hit the planet directly. What happens is there's, there's fluid that's already hit the planet and is flowing around it. This fluid is subsonic. Okay? It knows the planet is there, and it's going around the planet. And the shock is a transition between supersonic and subsonic flow. Okay? And that's what happens. You get this bow shock, and you get supersonic flow. You can see all these lines are completely straight, absolutely oblivious to the presence of something up ahead. These guys aren't even going to hit the planet, but they're going to hit the subsonic material. Okay? So that's really what happens. You get this bow shock, which deflects you around a supersonic object. And I'll put this in the notes. This is a cute calculation. It's actually not commonly done, but I think, I think it answers a question that one should have. It's like given this spherical obstacle and supersonic flow coming at it, how thick is this layer of, sub, of, super, of subsonic flow? This is known as the standoff distance or the bow shock thickness. And you can do this calculation fairly readily. What you need is a solution to a uh, second order differential equation. The solution was nicely worked out for us by Lighthill. You just match some things. You find that the standoff distance really at very high Mach numbers is independent of the flow speed. It's just this power, basically 1.18 times the radius of the object. You just flow around that. But what's most important for what we're going to talk about, I'll skip that other thing because it's not as important, is when you go through a shock like this, your density jumps up. Your temperature jumps up. That means your sound speed jumps up. One of the things with a, hydro, with a um, fully ionized plasma, does anyone know how big a jump in density you can get at a uh, Mach number million shock? <laughs> Say you could create a Mach number one million shock. The density will jump up. Does anyone know how big a jump you can get in density? Four. Yes, the answer is four. That just has to do with the uh, adiabatic index. In air, with the, a different adiabatic index, it's six. So you're, you can only slow down by a factor of four. So if you're going Mach, now let's put more realistic numbers. If you're going Mach 8, which the uh, solar wind frequently is, and it slows down by a factor of two, isn't it now going Mach 2, still supersonic? It's, it's going Mach 8. It slows down, its velocity drops by a factor of four. Most it possibly can. Now you're going Mach 2. Doesn't sound right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Your density goes up by only four. Your temperature goes up by as much as it needs to. The temperature goes up, the sound speed goes up, and you are now four times slower than you used to be, but the sound speed is a lot bigger than it used to be. And suddenly, and so here, here you have the kinds of jumps you're getting. Basically, at the nose point, the amount the temperature goes up depends on how the, sh the Mach number itself. It doesn't just hit a, a maximum. And then out here, it goes up even more. So this gives you an idea of what that temperature looks like. Here's what the Mach number looks like. Okay. So you get some very high, if you have 400 kilometer per second wind speeds, no matter what your upstream temperature is, it jumps to a value like this. It jumps to 3.6 million Kelvin. <laughs> Even, and typically you're starting from about 100,000. Okay. This is just your, your speed here. And if you're going twice as fast, the temperature here is going to be four times as big. Right? U goes up by 2. This temperature goes up by 4. And then this is the temperature in there. Okay, All very OK. Um, so here's a picture from one of the volumes just showing that, yeah, this cartoon is, uh, the simple cartoon I showed you is now reproduced with a little better graphics. And better still, this is Venus. Um, OK, that, that, that was there to sort of warm us up to a more interesting question, in my opinion, which is, what about those planets 
that are much more interesting to the likes of me that have a magnetosphere, that have a magnetic field, that have a dynamo inside that generates a magnetic field, and it forms this nice little dipole magnetic field around the Earth. Well, it's only a dipole until the fact is that the solar wind is hitting this magnetized body, and again, it sees it as an obstacle. It sees it as something that better go around. And it doesn't see it until too late, because it's going supersonically. But we have the same structure. We have a bow shock, and we have what's known as the magnetopause. That's the boundary that separates the solar wind. Now it's shocked solar wind from the uh, material that basically is, is stuck on the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, so, so it's not like a hard sphere. It's a squishy object. But the math is going to be all very similar, with the exception of the fact that our object is squishy. We don't know its radius ahead of time. Okay, So this, the picture is <laughs> I'm going to use, because after all, I've been able to solve one equation. We didn't go through it in detail. But once I know how to solve one equation, I want to just keep using that solution over and over again. So I'm just going to imagine that what I have here is a spherical boundary and just worry about what the radius is, the radius of the magnetopause, which I don't know, but it's going to form a sphere of some kind. And it has to be, it has to be in balance at this point, at all these places here, with that subsonic flow that's going around my squishy object. We're going to sort of see the, the, the trick I've pulled here. I used to have a metal ball, and I know how to deal with metal balls. Now I have something where it's basically magnetic pressure on the inside is pushing out against this pressure of the pressure of, of this flow here. But that pressure is entirely related to the, ba the ram pressure. Okay? That is what sets Oops. this oh, sorry this pressure here. Pressure at the stagnation point is given by four-fifths of this. The four-fifths, you would have thought maybe that would be a half, maybe it would be one. The four-fifths comes from this gamma uh, in some really complicated combination, but it just basically works out. Let's, let's ignore that. And it's basically the ram pressure. Okay? So the pressure at this point here is going to be the ram pressure. And the magnetic pressure over here is basically the pressure of, well, this isn't exactly a magnetic dipole. This is much closer to the kinds of, uh, the kind of um, solutions to the Laplace's equation we were dealing with before, namely one that has a Dirichlet condition on the outside and a Dirichlet condition on the inside. Okay, and so we get this kind of thing. Suffice it to say, that again just gives me a factor. 9 over 8 pi, that's all very interesting. But the pressure itself, magnetic pressure, is going to fall off as 1 over distance cubed. This is a case where the magnetic field is falling off as 1 over r cubed. And therefore, the magnetic field squared is falling off as 1 over distance squared. When we put that in with the ram pressure. Well, I'll just jump to it. The distance of the, so we have to balance this factor here against that ram pressure there and solve for RMP. That's to the sixth power. We get that the distance of that magnetopause is going as the one sixth power inverse one sixth power of the ram pressure. That's giving me the distance that my squishy object will squish to keep the solar wind flowing around it. That, without all the math, does that make sense to everyone? That's really what's setting the size of this magnetosphere, is a balance between the ram pressure, because it has to go around the magnetosphere, and the magnetic field pressure. And as you press in closer and closer, the magnetic field gets stronger and stronger the magnetic pressure goes up as 1 over distance cubed, 6, 6 power. So when we put in, for instance, my 400 kilometer per second wind and a solar wind density, that one I just had to look up. We put in an N. 
I don't know if anyone can do 45 over 32 pi to the 1 6th power in their head, but I did all of that, and you get 12 Earth radii. That's the distance the magnetopause wants to be under these conditions. Uh, 12 Earth radii. I know a lot of you do a lot of space physics in various ways, so let's compare this to other distances we might know. For instance, geostationary satellites. Huh, what? 6.6 RE. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, probably right. I, yeah, sounds about right. Yeah, 6.6 .6 radii. Uh, one of the ways you can work that out, if you don't, I don't carry it around in my head, but basically you have to remember that uh, a low Earth orbit satellite sa orbits in about 90 minutes, and GSO in 24 hours. So, and then you need to remember Kepler's law that the radius goes as the two-third power of the period, and you get 6.5, which is the two-thirds power of that ratio there. So more importantly, that's less than 12. So these things are inside that magnetopause ordinarily. Uh, how about the moon? Anyone happen to remember the moon? Light second. OK. That's good. Um, 60? Yeah. I, I get 58, but basically you have to remember 28 days, same trick, except instead of orbiting at 24 hours, you're doing 672 hours, 58. So it's outside the magnetopause. Um, and lastly, if we double, and here, here's sort of more of a scaling thing, if we double the speed, so we were in slow solar wind, say we're in fast solar wind, and say it's the same density. I don't want to do <laughs> more calculations than I have to. Uh, what will happen? First of all, I double u infinity, keep everything else the same. Is the magnetopause going in or out? Hmm? In, yeah. u is going up. It's in the denominator. Uh, it's basically a, one, two to the minus one third power. Not one I can do in my head either. Uh, it basically moves it in from 12 to, yeah, we said 12 to 9.5 Earth radii. OK. So um, oops. Uh, so th that was a very simple picture. I just want to justify doing this kind of, of simple analytic mathematics is very valuable. We have a lot of very powerful codes. Some of you are actually running one of them or another one. Uh, you know, obviously these are, are, you know, have a lot more fidelity, but you can see that the simple calculations are, are not giving us such a bad picture of what's going on overall. All right, I'm going to do one more. Uh, question for us to think about, mostly because you were working on this. Let's think about what happens to the magnetosphere of Jupiter. Okay, I will tell you, Jupiter has a much better dynamo than the Earth for various reasons that we talk about when we talk about that lecture, but it's basically 15 times the strength of the Earth's magnetic field. The dipole moment is, or B, B sort of at its surface, 15 times. We have, oh, sorry, I think I wanted to show you this formula here. We have this formula here, which involves the strength of the magnetic field squared to the 1 6th power, and rho infinity and u infinity. This is the density of the solar wind outside, by infinity I mean outside the magnetosphere, outside the bow shock, and the speed of the solar wind. I think, as part of your lab, you thought about how the speed and how the solar wind density, solar wind speed and solar wind density changed as you went from the Earth to Venus. Uh, Ju Jupiter, sorry, Jupiter. How, how do they compare? 
at Jupiter, given that we sort of worked out what it was for the Earth. This was part of your lab, yeah. Use about the same, and if rho is 25 times smaller, right? You remember that. Goes as rho goes as one over r, r squared, and Venus, Jupiter is at uh, five, five uh, AU. So when I put that in, I have that. I get that uh, the Jovian magnetosphere is 50 RJ, not 12, but 50. That's because I had that crazy power. It is 3.5 times 10 to the 11 centimeters. That's the radius. Who remembers the radius of the sun in centimeters? Nobody knows the radius of the sun. 696 watts. Ten to the power, times 10 to the power 8, so 7 times 10 to the power 10 centimeters. Yes. So this thing is five times bigger than the sun. The Jovian magnetosphere is five times the radius of the sun. It's the biggest thing in the heliosphere. It's the biggest thing in our solar system. Okay, if if you count it as a thing. So, and that's that's really because the solar wind ram pressure has fallen by a whole lot. The magnetic field of Jupiter is bigger. You know we can't. We can't forget that, but the, the ramp pressure has fallen off by a factor of 25. So it's, it's squishy, but it's not being squished very much. All right. Um, so now the last and possibly most interesting part of, of a magnetosphere, it's that you know if you just basically saw it as a, an object you couldn't penetrate, we've figured out what happens. It goes around. But it doesn't really only go around. The magnetic field, and this is what you're going to hear about after the coffee break, is reconnecting the solar wind magnetic field, reconnects with the Earth's magnetic field, okay, and we get some open magnetic field that is this, an open magnetic field in the, from the Earth, and we get a, a change of magnetic field topology from open to closed to open again. Okay, so the, the reconnection is taking, creating new open flux, new magnetic field lines that instead of closing from the South Pole to the North Pole are now open from the North Pole or open to the South Pole. Okay, and then in the magneto tail, it basically closes them back down again. And we're going to hear much more about this after the break. But most importantly, there is a rate in a number of Maxwell's. Maxwell is a Gauss centimeter squared, an amount of flux. If you use SI, it's a number of Weber's uh, per time. And that is actually related to an electric field. Okay? Um, one of the things you can work out is you have this big tail, and this is all the magnetic field that is open, goes off to the south, and then comes back. Here's the sheet, the plasma sheet that's in the tail of the magnetosphere. It separates the outward from the inward, the south from the north, sort of the magnetospheric Mason-Dixon line, if you will. Right? Separates the south from the north. Okay, And it basically, you can work out, if you know how much flux is in here, the total amount of flux, open flux, the flux in the magnetotail, uh, then you can work out how big this thing is. Uh, I want to skip because we're sort of running out of time. Let's just go to this calculation because if we have this total amount of flux in the magneto tail, it's the same as the total amount of flux that's basically open. That is the auroral oval. So this is called the polar cap flux. This is the north polar cap. There's the North America. Right? There's Alaska. You get the picture. There's the auroral oval. You count up the total amount of flux there. That's the total amount of flux there. That's the, the strength of the magnetic field. You get the strength of the magnetic field because 
Basically, this is the total amount of flux, the magnetic field strength, that angle, the radius of the Earth, pi, 17 Maxwell's. And then you have to invoke pressure balance again. And then you get that it is about 25 solar uh, Earth radii, right? That is, that is basically giving you, a, with this much flux, the pressure balance with the solar wind. So that's telling you how much flux is open. There it is. Again, we worked out the magnetosphere for Jupiter. There's the auroral oval on Jupiter. There's the auroral oval on Saturn. You see these beautiful rings of Saturn. Um, so what we have, though, is we have to, in order to create this open flux, we have to reconnect at the day side and then reconnect back at the night side. So there's basically this constant exchange of closed to open back to closed field. And that means the field lines have to cross over, cross, follow this, this uh, path. Um, but if you're following field lines, that's good in a plasma. Well, wouldn't you say the field lines are frozen in to the core of the magnetic of the Earth, which is not moving like this, right? It's just on on the time scale of, of days, it's just stationary. And it's creating all of the Earth's magnetic field. So how can the field lines move this way if they're frozen in to the core of the Earth? Can everyone see the puzzle here? You were told that magnetic field lines are going to move with the plasma. But there's a plasma here, and the magnetic fields are moving. But there's also a plasma in the center of the Earth, and the center of the Earth's plasma is moving much more slowly, centimeters per year. And it is true that in those plasmas, the field lines are moving at the speed the plasma is moving at. They're moving at very different speeds. Have we broken physics? Many of you probably never believed this frozen in field idea anyway, so you're like, yeah. Well, of course it was going to get you into trouble. No thoughts? Field lines are a real thing. Don't let anyone tell you they're not real. As long as you're in a conducting plasma, well, good conducting plasma, you can treat them as if they were solid. As if they're not solid, but real. They're flexible, but they're not. They're real. Uh, yeah, I, I love appealing to reconnection. I'm not sure that's really the right answer here, because I don't see a lot of reconnection going on between the, the core and the the ionosphere, say. OK, they're flexible. But are you meaning over, over millions of years, they're just constantly being stretched and stretched and stretched? They are real in a conducting plasma. They don't have to be rigid. But if I, if I stretch them, then they stretch and they get stronger. But as long as I'm in a conducting plasma, this is a good conducting plasma full of ions and electrons. The core is not as good, but it's darn good. I'm going to call it a good conducting plasma. How about between the core of the Earth and the magnetosphere? Good conducting plasma? I am standing here at a position between the core of the Earth and the magnetosphere. Is this a good conducting plasma? So we have a, a layer, basically, where we can't use that idea. So those field lines are frozen into the core, and they're not moving. And the field lines in the magnetosphere are moving. And between those two, there's no idea of what magnetic field lines are. They're not real in that one layer. Okay, And so there, we don't have to worry about them. But let's just focus now not on the core, but on the, on the magnetosphere here, 
where I have this motion. Now, this is two views. This is the magnetosphere. This is, I'm, I'm basically imagining that the field lines were all straight and they're all coming down into the northern hemisphere. And I'm not doing this in steady state. I just want to pretend that someone turned on the solar wind at some time. And that's going to start moving this, plas uh, this uh, plasma to the right, and the field lines are going to move with it. Uh, and then we get to the ionosphere, which is also a conductor, as we discussed. And then we get to the atmosphere, which, as I just said, is not a conductor. Okay, So we're going to see how this resolves itself when I try to move plasma this way. And I've given you a second view of the same thing. So this is this uh, motion here is actually coming out of the page, I believe. The, elect the velocity, oh, sorry, into the page. The velocity of the flow, there it is, into the page uh, over here, because it's to the right here. This is the current. It's actually going this way. The magnetic field lines are still going down. And I'm imagining that there's some, well, this is V cross B. This is what we heard about yesterday. E is minus V cross B. So that's actually coming out of the page here if you work out V cross B. So there's the electric field. There's the velocity. There's the current density. Then I imagine this has all started. And I'm moving them to the right. And so this bend here is moving downward. And the current layer is moving downward as that's happening. Finally, it gets to, it gets to the ionosphere. And below that, we do not have a conductor. So I don't have to worry about things. And in the ionosphere, we also have that drag between the neutral fluid and the conducting fluid. That's actually going to give rise to a resistivity. So the electric field will actually be related to the current density there. And then down here, there's an electric field and it has nothing to do with magnetic field at all. Because as we said, the Earth's atmosphere is, is an insulator. So you have electric field in an insulator, and that doesn't mean there's any current. So that's the standard picture. Now you see the field lines are moving in the magnetosphere. And they're not doing anything, essentially, at this lower boundary. They just kind of slide along because that's the end of their existence. They don't, they don't behave as a real thing. Okay. The interesting thing is to notice what happens over here. If I'm only moving a slab, so I'm not moving everything in the universe, I'm just moving the slab, then what we get when we've worked this all out is that some of these field lines are bent. There's magnetic field components coming out at me here. But then over here, they're not. They're not bent because they haven't been moved. And so if you work out the right-hand rule, you see current coming down here, across, and back up. Okay, This is the current system that has to happen if I'm to move a slab of the magnetosphere across the ionosphere, which is basically the last bit of conductor in the conducting game. Anyone see that? That's this is kind of a, an interesting picture, and it explains why you would have this current system. It basically goes along the ionosphere and then back up parallel to the magnetic field, parallel to the magnetic field. OK? So this MHD motion, this motion of a conducting magnetosphere, creates current in the ionosphere. And that's also couple, accompanied by an electric field. And we have these current paths that surround the slab. And that's, <laughs> after you've seen that cartoon and sort of digested it, then you can maybe make sense of this picture here uh, due to Jeff Hughes. Um, I thought this came out of one of the volumes. I'm sorry if I didn't label it. I'll try to label it again. Uh, it's in Kivelson and Russell. Ah, that's why I didn't label it. It's not ours. It's not invented here. Uh, yes. So it's not part of the heliophysics textbooks. Um, I, will, I will assume some blame for that. But it, it's due to Jeff Hughes. Um, here, here is that slab that we've moved from noon to midnight. 
okay? And basically the, the plasma flow or the magnetic field line flow, the plasma flow is this way, but this return current, basic, well, the, the return current, th this is basically the, the pattern that uh, is executed by those field lines, making these two convection cells. This is a, a use that I don't particularly like because in hydrodynamics we think of other things as convection cells, but now you've seen that this really is the motion of field lines in places where field lines have reality. Okay? And this is related to an electric field that is the cross polar cap potential. And you saw in Tuesday's lab <laughs> images that I think were a model, right, of the, of the potentials in the sphere. In the, those were models. Uh, much more sophisticated than the cartoon I just showed you. Okay, and the last bit of all of this, and we will end even ahead of time, is the same picture that because of this potential, we have an electric current that flows through this from A to B, but we also have those bent field lines here and not bent outside of there, so we have, or not bent there and there, so we have these field aligned currents, right? Those are, in the simple cartoon, those are the analog of this current here and this current here. So if you can digest this simple picture, and this is basically the level at which I understand things like this, then you can twist your mind into, into a sphere and figure out where these cross, these field aligned currents come in order to close things. Um, the last thing is, this is actually from volume one, so this one we can take credit for. Uh, we figured out what the potential was here. We also, or sorry, what the um, flux was here. We also know the uh, flow speed of the solar wind. So you can work out that basically you have to do one reconnection and then another reconnection and recycle this flux about every five hours. That's how long it's going to take those field lines to make it from there to there, following the field lines. And that gives you the, the voltage, actually, uh, 50 kilovolt voltage drop. These are kinds of things you, you saw illustrated in your lab. Um, so now you sort of see that, yes, the, this is not so complicated that a simple-minded astronomer whose knowledge of the periodic table ends at helium can uh, digest it and understand it. So this is sort of summarizing that simple-minded view. The uh, ionosphere is created by the X-rays and EUV photons from the sun. Uh, it diminishes during the evening because there aren't any photons, but it doesn't go away because it takes a while to recombine. Uh, the, solar f the solar wind would be deflected by the ionosphere if that's all it saw, as in Venus and Mars. However, if you have a magnetic field, the solar wind is deflected by the magnetic bubble created by that magneto magnetic field, the magnetosphere. And that is accompanied by reconnection, which drives the magnetic field lines from the day side to the night side and then back along the lobes. That is five minutes ahead of time to make up for the overtime I went there. So any, any questions on all of this at a simple-minded level that I could hopefully answer before you get the real experts coming in? I think Bob Ergen will be here on Friday and, and um, Tom Immel on Monday, right? Is that right? People who really know this stuff. And Fran Dagonal. Oh, sorry, Bob's going to be here this afternoon. Okay. So. If not, I think we're going to take a break, and then we come back at 10:20. Is that 10:25? Okay. And then Amitabha will. T That's right. One participant talk. Okay. Thank you.